it's uh, bilingual education, special education. Uh, and so uh, with that, there is uh, so many things that I've seen that this field has undergone, so many changes that I think is in, uh, that have both been long overdue, some that couldn't come soon enough, and some that we're still working on. So talk about the uh, understanding the educational evolution. I'll talk about uh, how cultivating the supportive learning atmosphere for all students, how that's beneficial for all students. It's not the easiest thing to do. It certainly does look great in theory. In practice, we've seen some of the amazing results that come from that, but it is by no far an easy thing to implement, which is why it's hard to find schools that do that effectively or that are working toward that effectively. And then we'll have uh, an opportunity for discussion, questions and answers. So there's just a few slides I wanna share. So in terms of my background, uh, yes, I am a professor at Northeastern Illinois University uh, in the city. I'm really, really, really proud to be there. That is an institution I feel that uh, really has fit my, not just my research agenda, but I think just my educational philosophy in general. Um, a little history on me. There's a couple of pics there of our grad students working with uh, students from the community. Uh, so I am a professor in the Department of Special Education. Uh, I direct the Children's Center, and that is where our graduate students who are currently general education teachers earning their credentials to become special education teachers, uh, they perform a practicum in uh, the Children's Center uh, for a semester where they work with a student individually uh, we perform psychometric assessments, uh, behavioral analysis, and screenings, and for some students who may need it, some life skills uh, programming. And so this is something that uh, my graduate students get to have practical hands-on experience doing. And uh, I myself, I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, and pardon Christy if I use the same jokes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've been at parties. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Um, there I was a special education teacher. Well, I was a bilingual teacher for one year, then special education teacher uh, for six years. And uh, I had a self-contained classroom for students with emotional behavioral disorders. And so, one, no two days were ever the same. But two, uh, one of the things that I, I'm really proud of, and I, I, I really owe this because of the, the families and their investment in their students and the amazing paraprofessional that I had uh, working with me, um, in all of those years, not a single student was sent for disciplinary infraction to the office. And this is all because the students uh, were, in, were in the best of care in the families. And this was a challenge because uh, that the school I was a teacher at is a Title I school, which means that uh, 80 to 80% 80 or above of the students were on free and reduced lunch. So that tells you that there was a lot of uh, financial need there, a lot of impoverishment. Uh, but during that time, uh, I was also earning my master's uh, in child and adolescent counseling from UT El Paso. And then uh, you know, the one thing about El Paso, I always always share this, uh, is that it's, it's some home to some very nasty women. And I say this with the most utmost respect. Uh, Stevie Nicks, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Debbie Reynolds, I mean, hello. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and so then uh, earned my master's and went to uh, Dallas, where I was a school counselor for a number of years. And during that time, I also worked on my doctorate at the University of North Texas. Uh, I had the most amazing doctoral mentor. Uh, and during that time, it was uh, <clears throat> burning the candle at both ends, full-time school counselor, pre-K through five, and then doing the, the doctoral program at night. Uh, but during that time, I think that's really, uh, that was some of the most formative years where I really saw the need to ensure that um, education really needed to be inclusive. It really needed to be inclusive in practice. It really needed to be inclusive in its mission because I think inclusion really is tossed around quite a bit. It placates stakeholders. It makes people feel they have a voice when in reality, a lot of schools, a lot of school organizations really do things to discourage parental involvement, uh, parental collaboration. And so to see people that are taking the time to be here, whether in person or virtually, I think that speaks a, a great amount in terms of the investment that you have for the children's schools. So that's amazing. Um, 
then I was uh, very fortunate. I uh, accepted a position at Northeastern uh, when they flew me in for the job interview. It was, I'd never been to Chicago. So uh, they flew me in in January. <laughs> and I, that, yeah, yeah. And so I brought what I thought was the biggest, thickest, heaviest jacket I had, which is what you call a whip breaker, right? So, uh, but I, you know, met the faculty and they described the position, said it was a faculty position, but it's also tied to our children's center. And I was like, I'm in. I'm in because I still get to work with families and kids, and I get to work with undergraduate and graduate students, so I'm in. And so I've been there since 2008. Uh, most of my research is focused on uh, emotional behavioral disorders, behavioral interventions, but more specifically and more recently, it's been on uh, genuine inclusion. So working with, uh, with school organizations and helping them to ensure that it meets their mission of true uh, genuine inclusion, collaboration, um, ensuring that it's not just something that goes on a mission statement and is never touched. I think, you know, it has to be genuine and always starting from the ground up, meaning that helping the teacher, helping teachers to connect with their students in the most meaningful ways, uh, helping to develop those relationships, both preventative in terms of challenging behaviors, but also important to the mission of our field. I think that's really what it is. And, and, and so I think that's the big takeaway from that. <clears throat> So in terms of perspective, perspectives on education, you know, across many schools, and uh, unfortunately, this is the case today, even though there's been so much federal legislation that's come across the last few decades that want parents involved, that stipulate that parents must be involved, we still see a lot of school organizations that see parents as adversaries. Oh my gosh, here comes this parent again. Oh, they're always going to want this and, and vice versa. You know, oh, I have this teacher. I, my, I had this teacher with my kid last year and my other kid last year. And it, it, it becomes quite adversarial. And there's very few opportunities that schools take because I do place this on the shoulder of the school organizations that they should be the ones to reach out to the parents. We are, you know, the educators, but the parents are ultimately the experts on their own child. And for a lot of teachers, for a lot of uh, traditionalists in the field, that, that's an uh, in, inconvenient truth. That's something that, you know, I, I went to school, I'm, I'm running the school, I know what needs to be done. And it really disconnects uh, the school-home connection. And so that's decades, right? And the one thing about, um, we see this polarization in, uh, in today's society because of politics. It's beneficial to whomever wants to wield that chasm, right? Whoever wants to keep that division going, it's beneficial to them politically, and it does nothing for our school system. It does nothing for the relationships between parents and the school, which makes it even harder. And again, I always emphasize, and I, I will be quite frank, I have had I think of one incident, uh, one incident that happened at a conference where I was presenting and I made this very simple, true statement. Parents are the child, are the experts on their own child. And I had uh, someone in the audience who is a colleague at another institution, uh, basically shot me down for about 15 minutes during my own presentation, because apparently that was a controversial statement for many people. And I don't think it's controversial. I think it's true. I think it's reflective of the mission of whether it's general, whether it's general education, special education, bilingual education. The parents know their own kid. The parents know their own kid, and that's their child. My gosh, you know, we, uh, locus parentis, right? We are trusting uh, our children to these other adults for so many hours a day. It has to be a genuine, high quality experience. And that gets lost in all of this. There are some variables in the homeschool relationship um, because it is a variable in itself, right? And if you think back to your own uh, educational experiences growing up, whatever grade you were in, we know there were some years that we had good grades, you know, that we were in good, enrolled in good grades, we had great teachers, and there were some that you know, they just weren't as good. 
Additionally, the culture of the school and how it accepts and relates to parents is another variable. You know, oftentimes, you know, I always make this, this case where, you know, when my uh, undergraduates, when, they, when they're just about to graduate and they're in the last semester and they're doing their student teaching and they come, they're like, Dr. Marino, I got a job. I'm teaching at this school. This is what I'm doing. And they're really excited. And sometimes it's happened. I'm at this school. I'm just not sure because, you know, it's this district and all this stuff. And, and I always tell them, you can be at an amazing school in a quote unquote terrible district, or you could be at a quote unquote not so good school or terrible school in an a quote unquote amazing district. It's about the individuals that are at the school. It's about the administration. It's about the faculty. Those are the people. They are the humanity of that school. And we often think otherwise because we see you know, especially for people that have children enrolled in public schools. Oh, what's the report card? I'm going to go online and I'm going to check a report card. That is a snapshot of one single aspect of that school and that's experience for that child. It does not guarantee anything. And parents ask, ultimately, is my child receiving a proper education to compete and thrive in society? That's what parents want. And that's one thing that I continuously drive home to my students, whether they're undergraduate or graduate, is we have to listen to the parents. We are serving students, we are serving the parents. And so when there are concerns that may not uh, necessarily align with this, you know, with what we're trying to do in the school, we have to help the student, the parents understand what is occurring in the school. And not only help them understand, but bring them in as a collaborative stakeholder. You know, being present is, you know, just part of the game, but being involved with the school, understanding, you know, my child is not the only child at the school, but my child is part of a school. I think that is something that, uh, that's something that a lot of schools don't take the time to, to emphasize. And to demonst and and to demonstrably demonstrably <laughs> to demonstrate uh, like in actions to those parents. So let's take a look at this educational uh, evolution. So there's increased value in communication and transparency, rightly so, because I can tell you. You know, I am very much Gen X. Uh, when I was, you know, going to school, my mom and dad both worked. My dad had two jobs. Uh, my mom worked all day. I was very much a latchkey kid. And my parents, for them, they just wanted to make sure I was taken care of at school and that I was getting good grades. They were involved to the, to the level that they could be because of circumstances. But that's all the schools required show up twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring, sign the paper that you were here, we're good. That's all That's all the school wanted, right? Parent, teacher, and I, oh boy, cookies and, and warm punch. <laughs> like that was it. That, a lot's changed since then, especially when we have, when we have a better understanding that individual students, all of us, have individual learning and behavior needs. And that our students, our children, are not learning in a vacuum. They're learning with others. They're learning in a dynamic. And they're learning with uh, the same uh, lovingly regarded individual children as our own. And depending on the parent-guardian personal relationship with schools, guides praise and concerns. We typically, uh, one of the things uh, that we see as adults is we evaluate schools based on our own personal experience with schools. So again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we remember our good years with good teachers. We remember our not so good years with not so good teachers. It's also important to note, I mentioned I'm Gen X. All of my education, with the exception of my doctoral program, took place in the 20th century. A lot has changed, right? We are in, right now, we are in a school that is in the 21st century using a 21st century approach that we have traditionalists 
that are very much in the 20th century, that are very reflective of 20th century values and practices. Typically, it's not uncommon to have, because we're basing a lot of our perceptions of schools on our own personal experiences, the quality of the teacher. The teacher doesn't sign any homework. What kind of teacher is that, right? <laughs> and we know, research has shown us that homework in certain capacities does have a role in education, not to dismiss it entirely, but it depends on how it's packaged, delivered, and what those expectations are. And I think back in the 20th century, homework was to be, was the demonstration product, right? If you came with this product, that means that you know the skill that you were taught. You, here you go, here's the proof, it's on the paper. That's all it was. And we know that homework is not the entire picture of learning. We know that sometimes, uh, I know that uh, when I had trouble with fractions, my dad helped a little more than he should have. He didn't know how to scale it back. He wasn't a teacher. He didn't know when to intercede and when to let go. Like he was just helping me to the best of his ability and what his judgment was. So he did nine out of 10 problems. I was okay with that. I was 10 years old. I didn't mind, right? But you think about that and, you know, that's, that's so much more of a marker. You know, there's so much more to a teacher than just how much homework do they get? What kind of homework do they get? We know 20th century perspective is quiet, complacent students are not necessarily signs of student engagement. If a student's quiet and in the back of the classroom and they're not making noise, they're learning. I have a quiet classroom. I had some, in particular in high school, I had some high school teachers that heaven help you if you were loud because that classroom needed to be quiet. That's a sign of true student engagement. That's a sign of true classroom management, a quiet classroom. Not necessarily, you know? And, you know, the other thing in terms of uh, my work with students with emotional behavioral disorders, we often think of students that have emotional behavioral disorders and due to the nature of their condition, demonstrate these challenging behaviors and they're often loud, they're quite visible. They're uh, explicitly demonstrated. Most of those happen to be boys. Girls that grow up having an emotional behavioral disorder tend to be quiet, withdrawn, and are typically not behavioral problems in the eyes of the teacher. So if you have a boy who's demonstrating these challenging behaviors and you have a girl who's quiet and draws no attention, which one do you think gets the attention from the teacher? The boy demonstrating. And oftentimes we find that girls uh, have uh, covert conditions, uh, conditions that are not necessarily seen, internalized behaviors, childhood depression, anxiety, and they literally suffer in silence, but they're quiet, so they don't get the teacher's attention. 20th century perspective. Teacher's content expertise is not the controlling factor in a student's education. Oh, my son's teacher did this and this and this and earned this degree and does all of this in mathematics and he's the strongest mathematics teacher that my students ever had. Content knowledge is one thing, pedagogy, being able to teach that knowledge, to get it from the teacher's brain, disseminate it outward to the students is another. And all learning is not limited to the classroom. In the 20th century, field trips were just a day to get away from school, right? Just a day to break up the monotony. Very rarely do we have Wednesday trips to the forest, <laughs> right? For true learning experiences. We don't, that's a 21st century understanding and experience. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, parent guardian relationships at school were relegated to parent teacher conference night or open house. And there was very little work to understand the student. If you want to understand the student, you have to understand 
and have a relationship with the parents or guardians. You have to understand the family dynamics. Uh, one of the things that has really become prominent in 21st century schools is understanding what's called uh, systems theory, meaning viewing the family, where the family lives, the community as part of a system in the life of the child, everything that contributes to the life of the child, and then that child brings all of that, they are that uh, encapsulation of that as they walk into the door. If you don't understand all of that, you don't understand the child. And so parents are the best way to understand the child. Parents, guardians are the best way to understand the child when they enter the school. And 20th century schools really don't believe in that. And also communication. You know, I mentioned I was a latchkey kid growing up. I mentioned, uh, you know, both of my parents work, worked and worked quite hard. Um, but with them, you know, schools would only communicate was, the only time they, the schools would communicate with them was if anything bad happened, right? You know, child did something bad. Oh, that's a phone call from the school. They only call it when it's bad news. That's, that still permeates, that, that perception still permeates a lot of schools today. And we tend to think that way because teachers don't have time to call when the kid's doing something right. But when, doing, when they're doing something wrong, they, are, they can't dial that phone fast enough. And that is very much a 20th century perspective and unfortunately across still many schools today. And of course, we had the last two and a half years, now going on three, where we've had a uh, you know, the uh, pandemic really upend uh, what would be a typically t developing childhood for millions of kids. Uh, you know, we had kids uh, within the last couple of years, I did a consultation. It was uh, just a very loose consultation with the school um, at the beginning of last year, the last school year, 21, 22, uh, re-entering kids uh, into full-time school again. And you know, there was a loss, a lot of a loss of their social skills because, you know, it's hard to socialize with other people over the screen. And granted, technology was definitely something that helped lessen the impact, you know, of, of staying home for, for health and safety reasons. But it also was very difficult to um, socialize genuinely, you know. And you know, I'll say it, it's not the same happy, ha having happy hour with your friends over Zoom <laughs> as opposed to being a person, right? That socialization for adults, we've noticed it. Kids definitely noticed it when they were gone. Um, you know, being able to understand how they uh, work together, how they learn together, particularly, especially if they are students that are coming from different backgrounds and they have different learning needs and behavioral needs. Because if they miss that, they're missing a lot of the amazing unpredictability of life, right? Of our society. You know, we all think of those times and we can all think of those times when we socialized with people that we would thought we wouldn't have nothing in common with. And it turns out that that was some of the most uh, amazing ways to the relationships that have come out of that. I think of two, two or three friends that are just coming to the top of my head. I would never have thought that they would be my friends, but because we were in person and we were under the right circumstances and dynamics, you know, they're life friends, right? And so kids have missed that. And it's more important for them because they're in the developmental years. So moving forward, how do we cultivate these types of supportive learning environments, especially for the school home relationship? Well, through meaningful relationships, we can cultivate one where we understand, we recall and understand that yes, my child, the most important person in my life or one of the most important people in my life, I want the best for them. They're going to a school, but that school is not for them only. It, they are part of a system. Every single parent is sending their child to school with that exact same hope that we all have for ours. To teach students, uh, to teach and encourage students to lift each other up, we're still in extraordinary circumstances, I'd say, from all of this, 
from the pandemic. And, you know, we're still in recovery. We've looked, uh, you know, I've, I've gone over studies uh, that the Department of Education has released. Uh, there's been a, a notice, uh, a significant drop in test scores for grades four and eight, and they attribute that to the loss of, of learning time. And even though that's not necessarily a measure here at the children's school, uh, rightly so, because that's just a snapshot. That is just one data point or datum. Um, but it's still indicative that us as a society has gone through some significant changes and still going through that and trying to address that. And we also know, particularly with behavior, there is a significant uptick in behavior, uh, behavioral concerns, behavioral uh, or disciplinary concerns across the country in grades K through 12. And I shared uh, with uh, the teachers earlier, even in higher ed, even in higher ed, we are having student, what we call student dispositional concerns, where these are adults and they are having difficulty acting as respectful, contributing adults in classrooms, even worse out in the field, you know, when they're doing their student teaching. These are things that are concerning because for whatever reason, I, I, I think that lack of socialization really had an impact. And so it's important that we model uh, pro-social positive skills, both at the home and school level and ensuring that both locations, both settings, both groups of individuals in the life of the child, school and home, have a connection and are on the same page of what those behavioral concerns are. And this is where, uh, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, classroom leadership makes all the difference, ensuring that the teacher is quite aware and attuned to the individual differences of the student, but also able to lead them uh, so that they can develop the learning environments that they want for themselves as a collective. That's quite important. And it's very difficult to do that and institute that at a school, in a school setting if there's no connection with the parents and guardians at home. Because if you want to cultivate pro-social behaviors that are beneficial, that are indicative of the behaviors we want our students to demonstrate, it has to be across both home and school. And one of the uh, things that's come out uh, is, again, because of that lack of socialization, we're seeing some bullying, uh, an uptick in bullying behaviors because kids are now being reintegrated, even though it's been a few years now. There's that lapse of time where they were not genuinely uh, interacting with each other, developing, nurturing uh, the relationships with each other. They're lacking some skills in their development because we're starting to see an uptick in bullying. And with that, we see that uh, anyone that's perceived as different, you know, one of the things that uh, that's come up uh, in the research has been what we call um, covert exclusion, where students have, they systematically leave another student out because of a perceived difference, whatever that is. Um, for whatever reason, Johnny's not part of our group, and they figured out some way to systematically leave him out. You know, oh, we're doing this. You don't like this. It's okay. You do your thing. Well, we're good over here. You know, it's systematic, ex uh, systematic exclusion, covert exclusion. And this is where students aged 10 to 11 often learn and utilize these bullying behaviors. And the scary thing about the covert exclusion, that is such an easy bullying skill set to carry into adulthood. Covert exclusion, uh, bullying behavior that exists unspoken between individuals. And again, based on nothing more than whatever differences that they perceive. And, you know, even though, you know, we, we, we see in the media, uh, and rightly so, I, I, I really, I saw so many instances of bullying when I was a teacher and when I was a school counselor, but it was never regarded in the media the way it is now, which I'm so happy to see that it's being called out, it's being named, and there's accountability that's starting to, to, uh, to really uh, become embedded in the structure. And um, the thing about covert exclusion is it's also bullying. 
and I, I will paint it with the same in the same uh, color as well because it's the systematic methodical exclusion of an individual. And unfortunately, even though it may not be the physical pushing, the taunting, the name calling or whatever it is, it's still bullying because that exclusion still leads, it still has the likelihood to lead to anxiety, childhood depression, and paranoid thinking. And most often it uh, can lead to difficulty in, a step in the development of trust uh, in school or with family, uh, family members. And while symptoms may disappear because of, uh, for whatever reason, the resilience of the individual, there still is an increased likelihood of some development of mental illness, depending on the severity and the frequency of that covert exclusion. So, you know, I did mention with the teachers, this is something to definitely be aware of. If they see it in the classroom, they need to uh, develop a plan to address it. And this isn't sort of a one-off thing, you know, like we have a, an afternoon to talk about it and then everyone's good. It's something that should be continuously revisited throughout the year because things change, circumstances change. Children will grow and mature and their perception of things will change as well. And so that's why you consistently keep up these messages of what we consider pro-social behavior. And more importantly, I also spoke this afternoon, and this is something I, also, I always talk about with my students, is the focus on the relationships that the teacher should have with the student, the genuine investment I talked about was considered unconditional positive regard, viewing the student first as the student themselves, as a person, separate from their behaviors, separate from anything that may be perceived as undesirable, negative, uh, challenging behaviors. They are an individual person first. And this is a great way to role model this uh, for students in terms of de helping to de develop and instill value and empathy. Focusing on the entire class rather than any individual or small groups, offering it as a class experience. And again, this is where communication and collaboration with school to home makes all the difference because this way, there is a shared investment in the same behaviors and the same values. And if there is this continuous open collaboration, should there be any concerns with the child to the parent, the, parent, the teacher already has the door open with the parent to communicate any of these concerns. And it also helps to ensure that the relationship is held at the center of the class meeting, because again, particularly in the children's school, as they focus on student-led uh, learning environments, this is a good way to ensure that the proper social behaviors that are beneficial to an all-inclusive learning atmosphere are put in the forefront. And again, for, and I spoke more to this about the, to the teachers uh, about unconditional positive regard, which is a counseling term uh, but it's starting to make its way more into, in, more into the classroom level at the teacher level, because we find that the teacher in many ways is not just the primary person to deliver instruction. They are also the primary interventionist for whatever it is, academic concerns or behavioral concerns. And so always keeping that in the center helps to uh, ensure that they're focused on the student and their outcomes. So those are just some of the points. I wanted to make sure that there was some alignment between what the teachers heard from me today and with you all. That way everyone understands that there's a commonality and a thread that goes through all of this. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I did want to uh, make sure we have some time for discussion or some questions. So I'll hand it off to you. Are there any questions, any points? Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my question is around the relationship building when everybody's super busy, right? Parents are super busy. So 
uh, you get diehards who will come to events in these evenings, but it's really hard because you also, you need somebody to feed your kids and get them to bed and all that other stuff. So what are your thoughts on sort of effective ways to do that, um, given how busy parents are and how ineffective sometimes email can be? Because I feel like it's a default, right? We push a lot of information that way, but it, it requires hired busy parents to read a lot, you know, it, so any thoughts on that, what you've seen work really well? Right, no, 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 uh, I think that's a very good question. You know, again, going back to my parents, um, Latchkey kid, they they certainly were busy uh they but that certainly didn't mean that they were not interested in my education mm -hmm. and i think that's one thing uh i have worked with so many parents over the years especially especially parents that their kids are having a rough time at school because of the nature of their disabilities i have never ever met a parent that doesn't want the best for their own child and that's one thing i continuously drive uh to the teachers that i work with and my students that Again, unconditional positive regard, regard. Make it's okay to make the assumption that they want the best for their child. You have to understand the other factors that are involved. And if they really know the parent, if they know the family, and they know that there is a hectic work schedule or unpredictable work schedule, uh, you know, one of the things that that comes up is, uh, well, the parent has this job and this job, and they're always busy. And I say, well. What are your hours? And they'll always say, oh, well, I have to be at work at seven and I'm done by four. Okay, that was that today? Yeah, how about tomorrow? Seven to four. How about next Thursday? Seven to four. So, okay, are you seeing a pattern? And I go, there's, there's some flexibility that comes in there. Parent may not always have that predictable schedule, but this is where flexibility comes in on your part. And, you know, email, email certainly has its place and its time and its purpose. But trying to find, you know, asking the parent, what are some good times during the week when you first meet them at the beginning of the year or when you have the first contact? You know, I always have, a, I would say, you know, have a card, have them write it down. You know, if you have parents that are good with texts or whatever, you know, and you have uh, that relationship that you can text stuff or email stuff, say, okay, give me the three times during the week that I can reach you. If that changes, please let me know. And those will be the three default times that I try to connect with you. And for some, depending on the teacher, depending on the school, if they're comfortable during the weekend to do that, sometimes that's what it takes. Don't ever be bound by that. You know, um, some school districts really uh, discourage home visits for whatever reason. Um, I was not a believer in that. I always felt very, you know, home visits, sometimes that was something I had to do. And, uh, it's just the willingness to understand where the parent has windows of opportunity. You know, I think that's really what it is. And it's hard when you have a large class, uh, but when you make those connections, that's an investment in the future, right? When something happens, you have that information to go to, as opposed to, well, let me shoot an email and see how many days it takes to see, you know, till I get a response. If you already know the three best times of the week to hit them, there you go. That's the starting point. And you're more likely to get a response than an email sent whenever, you know. And I have that too in, in some respect because I do work with parents, you know, when they bring their children uh, to the children's center. Obviously, it's a little bit of a different situation because I have parents that are willing to travel and bring their children. And it's a willing enrollment as opposed to someone who works in a public school and enrollment is compulsory, you know. But I think that's the first thing is, looking for those windows of opportunity, asking for them ahead of time, because one, that shows that shows to, from the teacher to the parent, I will be contacting you, whether, you know, for whatever reason you think it is, I definitely want to be able to contact you. And I would also state that it shouldn't be reserved just when they need it. It's always a good idea to reach them proactively. Hey, you know what, Johnny did great this week. I know last year in fourth grade, he had some some really hard spots, but this year he's been great. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. And me too, I just like related questions. I'm interested in like the best ways to explain to children like the spectrum of behaviors that they might observe in the classroom. 
And also how to explain to children like why different children need different types of supports. Right. I, uh, one of the things that I've always, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things um, that I've always talked about is uh, professionally is that we need to do a much better job of equating academic learning with behavioral learning. You know, I, I always use the example of uh, Johnny's a third grader. He can do two digit or he can do one digit by one digit multiplication. You know, and I ask him, hey, what's 335 by times 338? You don't know how to do that? What's wrong with you? Like, I can't have that expectation because he hasn't learned that. And, you know, behavior is very much in the same way if we regarded it as academic behavior, we would see behavior in a very different perspective. So asking Johnny to enter a quiet zone, whether it's a library or a church, if he had been taught that and that behavior has been reinforced by the parent over time, he has a repertoire, right? A behavioral repertoire that he knows what to do. We know he has the skills to do it and he's been reinforced. So that behavior is purposeful for him. If he's never been taught that, or he's only been to a quiet zone once or twice, like a library, he's never been told how you walk in, why you need to sit down or how you do something. That's an unrealistic expectation because we haven't taught him that the same way as that multiplication counterpart. So um, that's the first part. And that really is much more of a teacher perspective, but in terms of a parent, in terms of how you share that with your own child is some students need a little bit more help than others academically. You know, hey, you know, you, you, you said Sally has trouble reading and she doesn't like to read out loud. And, you know, well, you know, the teacher's there and that's, that's why the teacher's there to help Sally read and she'll get there when she gets there. And the same thing with behavior, you know, for whatever reason, Johnny is behaving this way. We don't know what's going on in Johnny's life. Uh, think about the day that you went to school mad. You know, you and I got in an argument right after breakfast and I took you to school and you were mad. I didn't know what you were going to be like that day. I didn't know what was going to be asked of you that day at school. It's the same thing with Johnny. We don't know what's going on in Johnny's life, but the teacher is there to help Johnny. And if anything happens where Johnny is doing something and you're not in agreement with that, you need to make sure that you are, first of all, you're not uh, assisting Johnny with whatever behavior that he shouldn't be doing. And two, you should understand that the teacher will take care of Johnny the same way as if he had trouble reading. You know, equating those differences helps because I had to incorporate, oh, it's, it's an old, it's an antiquated term. It kind of tells you how long I've been in the field, but we used to call it mainstreaming. So when my students, um, in when I was in the self-contained EBD classroom, emotional behavioral disorder, and we would take students and, you know, they were doing so well. And obviously we want them, for them, a lot of them, some of the best places to be was to be in the general ed classroom because they were there academically or they, they needed to be there for the peer interactions. You know, I had to do a lot of preparation with not just the teacher, but the classroom he was going in. And I didn't want to make it a big show in terms of here comes Johnny. And I said, I would prepare the gen ed teacher, the general ed teacher. And I would say, um, you know what? Johnny's going to be starting in two weeks. You know, I'd, I'd like to do a visit and I'd like to, you know, uh, again, I had a, an amazing supportive principal. I'd like to go in and, you know, I have this book that I have from the counselor about, you know, uh, welcoming people that are different. And so I put it up so it was far enough out there, but then it wasn't so obvious the next day. Like, oh, here's Moreno. He's going to read us a book about including other people. Oh, we have a new student. Like <laughs> a little much of the nose, right? But there's some long-term thought to it. It needs to be methodical. And so it, it, it was very much the, the last thing I wanted for my kids was to I didn't want to set them up to be uh, to be obvious, to be noted as a different one, because for a lot of the kids I worked with, that was what their lives were all about, was being the different one. And so for me, it was about not just ensuring that he was prepared and supported, but I also wanted the other students to understand the importance of inclusion without making it overt. Because after a certain age, 
when it's a little on the nose, it's disingenuous to them, yeah. even though it may be with the best of intentions. That was it was that type of like long term thinking that I had to invest in, mm -hmm. and it's not easy. You know, you you have to really uh, ensure that it's coming from a place that is genuine, and it really is just about inclusion, regardless of uh, more severe academic needs or more severe behavioral needs. Yeah, mainstream. That's an old word. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I teach the honors class at my school. So I'm going to, how do you help, how do I better advocate for those quiet kids? Because they're academically smart. They're smart enough that if they get pulled by the social worker, unless they're a kid that loves attention, but you can see they're, they're struggling because they're those quiet, well-behaved, smart kids, and they're struggling. How do you better advocate? for those kids and their needs, because they're smart enough to figure out the system pretty quickly. So so uh, explain a little more. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to- The kids who are quiet, but they have the anxiety. You can tell they have the depression. They're not, they're not going to cause problems in class. So they're mm -hmm. not the ones, when you bring it up to the social worker and they're talking, well, you've got this kid that's doing this and this kid that's doing that kid, like those kids get pushed to the back burner because they're the smart kids they're they're going to be fine oh okay. but they're, they're not fine <laughs> right so, like, so they're, they're fine because they they're smart enough to make it through all the they know where the hoops are and they know how to jump through them but they're still struggling how do you better how should classroom teachers better advocate for those kids that just because they're smart academically and they're getting by doesn't mean that they don't need support Oh, I would. Do you understand what yes, I'm saying? Yes. So, so okay. let me see. Let me let me uh, give it back to you. So to see if I understand. So if you're in a classroom and you have a student who is demonstrating externalizing behaviors, loud, you know, he has, this person has a history, behavioral history. So when this the counselor or the social worker pulls them out, it's not a big deal, mm -hmm. and they get that assistance all the time. And then you have a student here who is quiet and you know that they're, you know, as I mentioned earlier, suffering in silence, right? They have anxiety or they have some type of depression and they're quiet. They're academically, they're great, mm -hmm. but they're quiet and you know that they could benefit from some of those services. How do you advocate for those for those students? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I would absolutely just make it a one-to-one -one with which, whoever the service provider is, whether it's a counselor or the uh, social worker. And I bet you anything, they'll entirely agree. Unfortunately, um, in our system, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Which is why those students with the externalizing behaviors are always the ones that, you know, they get uh, all of the behavioral services or, or interventions or, or uh, social services they need because gosh, the teachers like, here, I need help. You know, they're, they're calling for additional resources. That doesn't mean that the student that's quiet and again suffering in silence that their needs are not as uh, as high. If anything, I would definitely bring that up to the to the service provider and let them know. And if they say, "Well, no," because her grades are are fine, she, they're doing great, you know. But if you have evidence that they have a condition that they would benefit from these types of services, to me. And this is my, you know, sort of my uh, I M H O. I learned that from my my nephew, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, that's a denial of services. You know, that's a denial of services to someone that could benefit from that. You know, and we have this in terms of disproportionality. So in special education, you have certain groups of students that are unfortunately over-identified, a lot of times false positives as having emotional behavioral disorders than other students. Black male students, twice as likely to be identified as having an emotional behavioral disorder than white male students. The most underrepresented group, Asian girls. And a lot of the times they will have, uh, they are disproportionately identified, or they are underrepresented because they are not identified as often. To me, that is a denial of services. Mm -hmm. These are students that absolutely have behavioral needs, emo emotional behavioral needs. They're different than those with externalizing behaviors, but they are needs nonetheless. 
So saying that you have, if you have a service provider that does not want to work with students like that, it's basically denial of service. But again, I've never met, uh, in my experience, I never met a service provider that says, no, she doesn't need it, I don't wanna work with her. I've never met one that doesn't wanna work with kids that has needs. But I, I, I would just say a very frank, here's my evidence, here's what I think, here's what I've seen, here's what she's told me, what can we do? And I think that's a great starting point. We have a question from on Zoom in the chat from Dola who asks, where can teachers and parents find additional resources, training and toolkits to leverage and better manage these diverse learner settings? That's a fantastic question. Um, I, I will state that, uh, you know, there's a couple of websites that are very good for parents. Uh, one of the first one I would start, and there's great sections because, and I, I, I'm a huge proponent of this because I've studied this uh, for most of my professional career. I, I'm very much a believer when it's implemented with fidelity, because I know there are some concerns with it, but positive behavior intervention supports, I think are a wonderful place uh, to understand all of these types of diverse learning and behavioral needs. So I would recommend the website, uh, pbis.org. It is from the Office of Special Education Programs. And there are uh, free webinars and downloads and guides for both educators, administrators, and parents. And I think that's a good starting point for that. Um, and if you're looking for more information, uh, I would definitely contact uh, uh, you know, anyone that uh, is associated uh, within the school, like the social worker here, uh, I think would have excellent resources for parents. Uh, but in, if you're just looking for a website or just something to start, a starting point, pbis.org is a good starting point because it's not just about behavior, but it's also about mental health. And there's a number of uh, very prominent uh, school psychologists and researchers and practitioners and parents that have contributed to that amazing uh, uh, database. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And they've shared the, uh, the the question, the person who asked the question has shared the website link on Zoom. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, easy to find, pbis.org. Yeah. Any other questions? Could you say a little bit more um, about the benefit of diverse learning environments. I think sometimes it is easy to see what's challenging about them. Mm -hmm. And I know I hear from teachers and also parents who worry that one child's needs or are, are taking up a lot of time and attention or are negatively impacting their child. Um, so what would you say about um, the benefit for, for all children of those diverse learning environments, even though there are challenges. Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, diversity in every shape and form where we talk about humanity is very much a strength. I think uh, for many individuals, and I think unfortunately, politically uh, in these last couple of decades, it's seen as a disadvantage, it's seen as a burden, it's seen as an unfair uh, allocation of resources for, for individuals from others. And um, I, I, I think that's quite untrue. I don't think that there is any truth to that. Uh, I think of anything, it is much more reflective of a lack of understanding. I think having diverse learning settings um, is truly uh, beneficial because of the fact that it helps students to understand our society. I think uh, being able to not only learn, but to succeed and to have to see the success in others in a collective, I think is important. And schools are definitely, they are the microcosm of our society, right? The, everything in our society feeds into school and education because it is, it captures everything. And when you have a school or a classroom that's that has diverse learners, regardless of their background, everyone here even in this room right now, we all have different learning and behavioral needs. And having a good understanding of that as a child 
and it's carried and it's positively reinforced as an attribute, as an advantage, I think makes that person, uh, will help that student grow into a person that's understanding, reflective, and appreciative of the differences. And being able to see that differences are not, uh, they're not a mark, they're not a disadvantage uh, against a group or another, uh, within a group or another collective. I think it also helps us to learn to adapt to different situations. I think it also helps us to see benefits of different points of view, different perspectives. The one thing about behavior, and I talk about this a lot, depending on where students come from, is, uh, you know, historically, U.S. schools since the 1950s have been, have utilized the establishment of behavioral expectations set by white middle-class values. And to assume that that is the same in 2023, I think is, is, is rather, um, it's inept. It's not a good, it's not a good alignment. Just because someone uh, has different values, it doesn't mean that they are not, uh, when they have different values, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they're, those values are the antithesis of our own. They're just different. And when we look at the things that we all truly value, we find that we have that in common at a family level. When we look at the classroom, oftentimes, particularly in public schools, and I, I've talked about this, the research shows this, teachers are very quick to learn how to get the student out. They've utilized procedures that are meant to assist students, to identify students with genuine disabilities or just genuine learning differences, to say, this kid needs to get out, can't help him. And so with that, there's a lesson in there. Sometimes if the, if the teacher is doing that with genuineness and saying, I, we really need to help the student, I think it's seen in, 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 a, in a type of role modeling experience that when we can't help someone, we find out where we can get help. That way everyone sees that there's still an investment in that student. But when systems are turned selfishly or out of ignorance, that's a concern because now we're, we're showing our students people are expendable. They can be removed. They can be taken out of context they can, or taken out of that, that con uh, context. And we have no value for another human being. So when we have diverse learning settings and we see that there's different dynamics in play, I think there's, some, there's truly inherent benefits to that because we want our students to see that we work with other individuals as best as we can. And there is, uh, there's value in understanding that we all have different behavioral and learning needs. When I would incorporate my students with EBD in general ed classrooms, you know, the one thing I, I would have, you know, I recall very specifically one teacher, if I have to send them to the office, you find someone else to put them in. You find them, you find them another classroom to put them in. And that was not a threat. That was a promise. And that was very, and that was my first year teaching. <laughs> and so to me, that was like, if you're the teacher, and in my perspective, you're leading this classroom, that's a lesson you're teaching everyone here, you know? And I certainly wasn't going to put that student whom I didn't think was not ready. I thought that student was absolutely ready to be in a general ed classroom. I was making absolutely sure that student was gonna have all the necessary supports to be successful in that classroom. And he was. And I think that was an important lesson. One of the big thing, one of the amazing things out of that is that student eventually was in gen ed classes three years after my, after he was with me. And to me, that was because the teacher did come around, the students followed, and that set up my student for success. That is diversity. That is value and diversity in an educational setting. So it wasn't easy, believe me, it wasn't easy. The teacher, uh, turned out to actually be one of my best friends after a few years. But it takes a lot of time and understanding. And I think 
but the investment is worth it. And it's worth it for everyone. And I would hope from that point forward, all of the students really saw and understood that. So that's what I would say to diversity in the classroom. Yes. So kind of off of that, how do you promote kind of that removal of like deficit thinking towards students or create the, oh, I wrote it down, that unconditional positive regard? How do you advocate for that when certain teachers, I mean, I'm making my school sound terrible. It is not. <laughs> Don't necessarily have that philosophy mm -hmm. of students can do it. As I said, I teach younger students, so I get a lot of, well, your students can do that because they're the honors kids, not because everyone forgets. I taught, I'm not special ed, I taught gen ed. All those kids did it too when I taught them. Like, how do you help bring others around from that deficit thinking to that unconditional positive regard and all of those things? I think deficit, uh, deficit perspectives, I think that is very much, that's a societal point of view. That's really hard to combat because even in 2023, that is still very much how we view individuals, you know, not, you know, in and out of education, right? We do have instances where someone can't do something, get them out, they're of no use. And that's really hard. And I think the way that we, you know, for me, unconditional positive regard, that was something that is, that is a genuine gem that I learned uh, when I was in my master's program. I was telling Christy uh, earlier, when I was in the classroom working on my master's as a counselor, you know, I was, I'd work with kids with EBD during the day, go to school, uh, work on my master's at night. And it was all counseling, child and adolescent counseling. And unconditional positive regard was one of the first things I learned. And gosh, I took it back to school the next day and that's what I started using. Like that was my belief, that was, that was my philosophy and it really changed everything. It was literally a game changer for me, yeah. night and day. And it's hard to, I, I consider that part of professional training. I really do. Um, it's wonderful when I you know, mention it, like I have this evening uh, with you all and with, with uh, the teachers, but it really is a professional aspect. It needs to be, it needs its time. And you have to have a willingness by the individuals to learn it. Um, it is nothing without professional reflection. You cannot be honest as a professional and reflect on your own uh, implicit biases, uh, your own histories, it's, and, and your own experiences. It's really hard to cultivate that. And so it really is, I think, and it, it really should be offered professionally. And I, I'm happy to see that the research is starting to show that that is indicative of where our field should be going uh, to help us move away from the deficit perspective. Because gosh, if we all live by the deficit perspective, I probably wouldn't be here because of the nature of my background, right? Because that's that's how society has always has functioned for so many, many, many uh, centuries. You know, those that are different from us, those that cannot do the things that we value, uh, that's hard. And so asking, you know, how do we institute that on an individual level? I just say, let it start with the individual. Keep doing what you're doing. Role model. And when there's opportunities to advocate for or to bring up possibilities of professional development, absolutely bring that up and, and keep fighting for it. Because everyone else around you is going to be like, Unconditional what? <laughs> you know, but it's worth it's worth the investment, it's worth the time, and I consider it part of professional training. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess maybe it kind of as a follow-up, you know, went to a parenting seminar once on Tuesday chat, Tuesday's child, and they talked about the philosophy of like catch them being good. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on the small stuff, like mm -hmm. you know, identify a couple of behaviors that you want to see change and be really observant for like small signs that they're you know complying with that behavior and focus on that as opposed to the negative behaviors. Is that like for both like parents and teachers? Is that a philosophy you would also suggest? Absolutely. Absolutely. Behavior change, um, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, I talked earlier this evening with the teachers about a student who's been using a challenging behavior, uh, not to get into all of that, but you know, if they've been using this behavior to get what they want, that's a learned behavior. 
they found that that behavior works for them. It may be challenging. It may be, uh, it may impede instruction. They don't care. It works for them. And so if they've been using that in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and now they're in fifth grade, to reinforce a new behavior, a replacement behavior that is pro-social, that, uh, that does help with instruction, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. You know, if they're using a behavior that's worked for them for three years, it's going to take time to change that. And so uh, whenever you look for behavior change, behavior change can be that much, but that's still change. That's still change. And I think, you know, that's the one thing, um, you know, when we think of behavior change, that it needs to happen as soon as possible, you know, right? Like it's going to fly, uh, straighten up and fly right kind of perspective. In reality, you know, research shows us behavior change takes time. If you want to look at, you know, if you want to look at a timeline, think of a time in your life or for any of us when we've had to, when we've tried to facilitate behavior change for ourselves and how long and how arduous, you know, it was. And, you know, we think behavior change, you know, if, if we want to increase the demonstration of positive behaviors, we always think it's, you know, or when students improve academically, it goes straight up. Never does change happen? You know, when we see an increase in positive behaviors, an increase in academic learning, it trends upward, right? It does. It's not a straight line up. Mm -hmm. Only planes fly straight up. <laughs> like it's incremental. There's peaks and valleys, but it trends upward. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be appreciative, and we need to continue to reinforce if we see just that little bit of behavior change because that's a start. Well, I want to be mindful of our time, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Moreno, for talking with us. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure if you have another question, you can walk on up and on. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all for having me this evening. It's always a joy and a privilege to be here at the Children's mm -hmm. School. You know, I, I've always uh, been fascinated and, and amazed with the work that goes on here and the learning that goes on here and so I thank you all for coming out tonight and to you online thank you for joining us it's been a privilege thank, thank you. you and I will leave my contact information up um, feel free to email me just say if you have a question hey so you at the children's school and go on to that thank you all right thank you all <laughs>